Good morning. I'm Adrian Monk, Head of Communications here at the World Economic Forum. Thanks for joining us for this opening press conference of the World Economic Forum's annual meeting 2014. The theme of the meeting is the reshaping of the world, consequences for society, politics and business. Now, I'm going to do something which is turn my phone onto silent. Please feel free. I know you're all busy people with lots of calls coming in to turn yours on to silent so we can hear from all of our co-chairs. I'm delighted to be joined by five of them. Two of our co-chairs will be arriving a little later this morning, which is Chairman Zhang of the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China and also Joe Jimenez from Nov Novartis. But joining me today, Aliko Dangote, President and Chief Executive Officer of Dangote Group in Nigeria, Marissa Mayer, Chief Executive Officer of Yahoo and a young global leader at the World Economic Forum, Chris Gopalakrishnan, President of the Confederation of Indian Industry, Judith Roden, President of the Rockefeller Foundation, and Christophe de Margerie, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Total. So without further ado, I'm going to ask each of them to share some of their hopes and expectations for this meeting, and then uh, we'll have a little bit of uh, Q&A after that. So first off, sir, I'm going to ask you, Mr. Dengote, to share your hopes for this 44th meeting of the World Economic Forum. Thank you very much. Uh, well, my uh, hope is that uh, since, you know, you've seen that uh, since 2008, we haven't really had any issue. So uh, the issue here now is just consequence for society, pol uh, politics and business. And the gathering really has been very, very, very impressive. And I think what we need to now do is that how do we keep, uh, you know, improving, uh, you know, the world? How do we reshape? Uh, from the context of uh, Africa, when you look at it, uh, we have actually have uh, quite, I mean, we have had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, economic growth, uh, you know, and what you see is that people are now are beginning to understand what Africa is all about, the opportunities that are there, uh, the challenges, some of them are very, very perceived. And I think we have a couple of sessions that will actually drag and make people to understand that having wealth, we have to use that, uh, the wealth to make sure that we, uh, you know, serve uh, the society. Uh, number one on the agenda, which I would like to, uh, you know, concentrate on is actually to do with youth employment. And I think uh, the youth employment is something that we, you know, we all have to look into it. Not only the developed world or the emerging market, even in areas where we live uh, in Africa, uh, where we're just starting. I can say that we're just starting. We need to make sure that we create the skills that will continue to drive the growth that we have, uh, you know, in uh, Africa. So that's just what I have. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today. I think that when you look at the World Economic Forum, and in particular the annual meeting, it's really a place where we get to discuss the most critical issues of our time. And when you look at technology, it's rapidly reshaping our world today. And so I'm really excited to see the inclusion of technology at an, at an, at an unprecedented level here at the annual meeting. But also, I want to stop and commend the forum for the inclusion of women and their efforts around gender equality. I know Judith and I are particularly pleased to be here uh, as co-chairs. But also, the work that's been done around the communities of new champions the young global leaders, uh, the global shapers, uh, as well as the technology pioneers. It's tremendous to see that inclusion. Uh, and back to technology, when we look at how technology can reshape the democratization of information, the way it can connect people and ultimately improve the quality of life, I know I'm really looking forward to seeing the new ideas and new innovations uh, presented here at the forum around how we will leverage the tipping point that we're at uh, in terms of technology and what can be achieved to ultimately shape our future. Thank you. Marissa Maya, thank you very much. Chris Kapalakrishnam. Thank you, Adrian, and good morning to every one of you. <clears throat> one of the topics that um, I'm participating in some of the panels and <coughs> that is interesting to me is the changing nature of work and reimagining employment. Um, Marissa talked about the uh, impact of technology. Technology is one of the factors that is changing uh, the nature of work. Demographics plays another uh, important role. The state of development of an economy plays a role here because different regions have different challenges. India has its own unique challenge where we talk about um, unemployment, but more importantly, 
um, not employable, unemployable. Uh, that's the bigger challenge for India. And how do we skill large number of people to actually take advantage and participate in the opportunities that are provided today? Um, so that's one you know, large uh, set of uh, themes which I'm very keen and interested to hear about uh, other people's ideas and uh, share my own thoughts in this regard. The second area that is very, very important is sustainable uh, development. Uh, how can we look at growth in a manner in which we don't take away from future generations? Uh, we leave the world a better place to live. And what are, again, the new ideas and the new thoughts uh, that are emerging um, as, as people come from different parts of the world to share their ideas here? Uh, India has always participated in large numbers at the World Economic Forum. We have about 120 um, leaders uh, from business, government, etc., at the World Economic Forum from India. And I um, look forward to actually uh, sharing my thoughts on India, um, listening to other people, what their thoughts are, what their concerns are, and uh, you know, take these thoughts back when we go back to India. So those are my thoughts at this point. Chris, thanks very much. Judith. Thanks, Adrian. I'm delighted to be here with my uh, fellow co-chairs and to talk about philanthropy's role and how the forum really is a wonderful place for us. Um, all of the sectors are changing, and it's no longer the case that government only makes policies and business only makes uh, products and philanthropy makes grants to NGOs. Everybody is collaborating now on solutions. And the forum is a place where solutions-driven activity is really front and center. And so I'm looking forward to continuing those conversations here. But we at Rockefeller see philanthropy as de-risking private capital in some ways, doing the high-risk innovative pilots, um, creating leverage for new kinds of approaches and new kinds of ideas. And the two areas that I think um, are most compelling, the trends that uh, we're keeping our eye on and that will be a great deal of the conversation here at Davos. First, we've already talked about youth employment and more uh, tragically, youth unemployment. Uh, if we focus on Africa alone, we talked about Africa. Um, the youth population will double from 200 million to 400 million by 2030. And so how do we continue to generate engines of employment and employ employability, not only on that continent, but throughout the world? And I look forward to many conversations, starting with the uh, IBC meeting later today, that will take that up. The second is really urbanization, and it intersects with both uh, job creation and sustainability. Uh, most of the urban growth we're seeing around the world is taking place on fragile ecologies, on fragile coastlines, um, places where the impact of climate change is already coming to bear, and we're all seeing those effects. Uh, large coastal cities, many of them in growing middle-income nations, uh, could have a combined annual loss, it's predicted, of about a trillion U.S. dollars uh, from these events by mid-century. So how do we reframe the narrative from focusing on these crises and looking only at humanitarian aid to really thinking about building both within our coastlines, within our cities, and within our economies resilience um, that allows us to rebound more quickly and more effectively from many of these shocks and stresses. And in the process of building resilience to create uh, a resilience dividend that really allows not only safer and more effective rebound, but structurally allows economic growth and job creation. So those are the kinds of conversations that I'm looking forward to contributing in, uh, contributing to and learning from uh, during the uh, several days of the forum's meetings. Thank you. Judith, thanks very much. Christophe de Marjorie. Well, uh, good morning all, too. And uh, I want to tell you I'm really taking very seriously this uh, co-vice chairmanship uh, at this uh, Davos Forum. So usually I like to talk about a lot of subjects, especially when you talk about reshaping the world. We don't know where to start. But here I would like to concentrate, to focus, as my uh, Anglo-Saxon friends would say, focus on two subjects. One which is Europe, because Europe is not only a problem for Europe, it's a problem for the rest of the world. We are part of it, and we have a role to play we have certainly need to redefine, and I would use a word which is reinventing Europe. 
because I mean, it proved to be relatively successful during the euro crisis, but it's not over. And I frankly believe that Europe has to play a role. It's not over. Let's find it together. But don't think it's something which is just for European people. It's for all of us. Mm. The second subject, which is definitely much more linked with uh, being in charge of uh, oil and gas company, often being uh, in the middle of criticism for, I must say, sometimes good reason. I would like that we refocus on what has been one of the major subjects two years ago, climate change. And climate change is still there. And uh, I'm not hearing it anymore, but uh, it's part exactly of what we were saying about reshaping the world. Today, you have uh, two billion inhabitants without access to electricity. In 2050, there will be an additional two billion more. I said 2,000? Two, two billion people lacking electricity. There will be two billion more inhabitants of the planet. And, and mostly talking with our African friend from Africa. Those people are those who are calling excluded. And we cannot talk about exclusion. I was hearing the message of the Pope yesterday. Message was be careful, exclusion. And exclusion is on everything. It's inclusion on rights, it's inclusion on wealth, and it's exclusion on energy. As far as we can do everything, I would like that we focus on just stop to be antagonizing people. Just stop to be incoherent, asking for something and the opposite. And I would like that the industry I represent, oil and gas, can and should take a major role in saying first, that's what we're doing. And that's what we're doing to be committed to better energy. But it's a difficult role, but that's our role. And that's why we're in Davos. Thank you. Thanks to all of our coaches. Got time for some questions. And uh, just before we start, if you could identify your name and organization. If you do want to ask a specific question about the business or about the organization of one of the coaches represented here, you'll have four days to catch up with them uh, to talk about that. This is the opening press conference to talk about the themes. So please, I know what a very smart and uh, distinguished uh, group you are. Let's keep uh, questions on the themes of the meeting. Can you just let us know where you're from and uh, we'll get a microphone to you. Okay. My name is Corinne Swanson and I come from Sweden's Business Daily, Dorgan's Industry. And I have a co-question for Mr. Dangote and Ms. Meyer. And I would like uh, you to reflect on what opportunities uh, technology represents to Africa and what opportunities does Africa represent to the ICT industry? Who would like to start on that one? Uh, well, I think that when you look at what's happening, particularly with mobile devices, it's clear that Africa is likely to skip the landline devices uh, and move straight to mobile. That's already happened. Uh, and when you look at what mobile really enables with the sensors that we have in terms of really providing a lot of information and context for people, the services that can be provided both in the developed world as well as the developing world uh, are really profound, be it helping people understand where services are, understanding where the best experts are, understanding where employment is. Fundamentally, technology is about connecting people and making them aware of all the opportunities and efficiencies <coughs> around them. So I, I'm particularly bullish on how technology can help to reshape Africa. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much uh, for, for your question. Uh, I think like what Melissa said, definitely uh, technology will shape, uh, you know, uh, Africa. You cannot really imagine how bullish, you know, uh, anybody, you know, uh, can be. Uh, for example, let me give you an example. Ten, about 10, 12 years ago in Nigeria, we had a total of uh, less than half a million telephone lines, both mobile and landlines. Uh, today, you are talking about 100 and, uh, you know, 129 million lines. We have 47 million people using the internet today in Nigeria. So you can see the massive uh, revolution, not only in Nigeria, all over Africa, especially the sub-Saharan Africa. So there's quite a lot, and I believe really technology will move uh, Africa forward. Uh, it's just the beginning. 
Thank Adrian, you. may I Thank may you. I say sure. just one thing? Um, we see in African, particularly as I talked about the youth bulge uh, that we see coming, that technology and digital jobs are a place for youth skills training. Um, we at Rockefeller have embarked on an initiative called Digital Jobs Africa, which will bring a million more people into the digital economy focusing on youth at risk. So it's a greenfields opportunity in, in many cases for uh, a real focus on youth and skills training as a mechanism for economic development and growth. Sure. And you want to yeah, so, yes, I mean, like, uh, you know, what the, uh, uh, you know, w when you look at it, why mobile? I mean, are people just using mobile for fun, just talking to themselves? No. You see, today in Africa, for example, where it costs you a lot of money to open an office and call, you can just advertise and put your telephone number, and you can easily be contacted. So a lot of people are using mobile as their office, you know, I mean, as a contact uh, number, where it has actually opened up a lot, where people now have uh, disposable income by, you know, people contacting them to come and do one job or the other. Thank you. Okay, can we... Uh, well, the mobile banking, you know, you can see what actually uh, is happening in uh, Kenya. In Kenya, mobile banking, uh, they are, you know, you know, transparent uh, about, you know, in a year. Last year, I think they did almost about over $12 billion worth of activities, and uh, we've started using that in Nigeria. So other areas, too, they are using it. You know, it's a very new thing, and it's moving on very well. Great. Just so we can get around the number of hands raised, can we put gentlemen at the front and then two ladies in, the, in that row? And then, gentlemen, there, we'll, we'll do three, and then we'll do another batch of three if we can. Okay, Paul Carroll from Reuters. Um, first question on technology, specifically cybersecurity. How concerned are you all about that, um, particularly in light of the data breach at, at Target Corporation and the theft of credit card details? Um, and secondly, uh, how do you see the situation in emerging markets, particularly the corporate chiefs? Is that, are you looking to file into emerging markets, or are you, are you backing out? And perhaps just a final follow-up. <laughs> nice try. Europe. That's three questions. <laughs> <laughs> what does Europe need to do? Okay. Uh, can we get the uh, mic to uh, the ladies there, just to get your questions as well? <coughs> My yep. name is Sarah Antagnova, the Spanish press agency, EFE. Mm, this year, the um, number of uh, female participa uh, participants decreased two, uh, uh, um, two points percent to 15 percent. Last year, you said you were w going to improve this issue, but um, it's just the opposite. Why? And what happened? Thank you. I can probably dive in just straight away and just answer that. It's actually uh, participations at 16%, not 15%. That was from early registration. But it's not something we're happy about. Uh, the forum has a gender gap report which comes out every year, which basically lists gender uh, disequality across nations and ranks them and looks at where the opportunities are to work with governments to actually address that long term. And you'll see that the forum has a number of task forces in place, specifically with governments like Turkey and Japan, uh, to work on long-term solutions to what is one of the major challenges of the next 10 to 20 years. And I think what you'll see today, if you look out for, for Prime Minister Abe, is uh, a focus on the opportunity that's represented by empowering women. So I think what the forum is trying to do is make sure that this stays on the agenda. If you look at women's representation in global leadership, very small fluctuations in leaderships of big organizations and big businesses can make a lot of difference to those very small numbers. But we're not interested in the optics of this meeting. We want to share the information, but what we really want to do is address the long-term issues. And Sadia Zahidi, who heads up that gender gap program and works with those governments, has been doing a lot of work, and I think at this meeting you'll hear more about the commitments from major governments to make the kind of changes that will really move the dial on not participation at this annual meeting, but real participation in real organizations through the world. So thanks for asking that. Lady next door. Um, hello, this is uh, Tatiana Benza from W Radio and Twitter Group. Um, I had a question for Marisa Mayo. Uh, you were talking about the positive impact of uh, internet in publication of the information. But also in the last uh, part of the uh, last year, uh, we were seeing a, a maybe negative impact with the surveillance and spying uh, revelations. 
uh, what are, are your thoughts about it and what can be done to balance a little bit? Okay, aware of the time constraints, I'm going to just ask each of the panelists just to address those issues. Really, if I can join those together about cybersecurity and, and trust, um, and also about emerging market opportunities. And I'm sure Christoph will want to come in at the end on uh, on addressing the Europe issue that Paul raised. So, uh, actually, we'll reverse the order, shall we, and give uh, give Christoph a chance to come in first. Christoph, do you want to begin us? I have always my chance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, it's not the easiest one, this question about, uh, about Europe. Uh, I was on purpose using the word reinventing. First, we have elections coming in May, so it is the right time. And, and my first worry, all of us, is how many people are going to come to vote? That's be very important. And then if they vote against, what's going to be the future? Because democracy is, you have to accept that those voting says no. And if they says no, how you continue? And we will have to continue, even if we will get this answer, which might be possibly no. So what can we do? I would have, just don't, just don't take it as being provocative, but I think Europe should be reconsidered as an emerging country. <laughs> uh, the, 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 well, the same way we always talk about emerging countries as being BRICS, we never, we never say anything about Africa. I mean, Africa is made today one of the biggest if you can consider 53 countries as a state, is one emerging country. Europe has to be, in one way, added additional skills. Go back to competitiveness. Today we are just trying to fight against those who are doing sometimes the same product at a cheaper cost. We cannot compete like this. And we cannot always complain that China is this and, and blah, 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 and Japan and whatever. No, we have to upgrade the skills of our engineers, workers, at all levels, and fold them, I'm using the word force, which is not, not, democra not democracy, but which is forcing them, in that case, to bring on the market new products which can't find their position, their market, in within Europe, which is the first market, but also outside, and why not in emerging countries? We have to prove that it works, even in total, we are doing a lot of business in China, which is very competitive. I can tell you in China, when they can find something they cannot do themselves, they buy it, they pay the price, and they respect the contract. So I could be much more vocal on this, but frankly, we need to restart on a new base. Let's stop thinking that we will rebuild things on things which cannot be anymore the source of development and growth for our countries. And also, let's stop to make a difference between South Europe and Northern Europe. Because in that case, Europe is dead. And in that case, we will be to reinvent to Europe. But that's not the message I would like to deliver today. I c and I think, Paul, there was probably a sound bite in that, wasn't there? <laughs> 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 Christoph, thank you. Uh, Judith, do you want to just talk a little bit about uh, the cybersecurity issue that was raised and emerging market opportunities? Um, quickly, you heard me mention resilience in my opening comments, and part of a resilience strategy is actually delinking and denetworking. And it seems that we are making more integrated systems that actually are making us more vulnerable. We're not going to be able to build walls to everything. And so creating in our technology systems fail-safe capacity, islanding. When we talk about smart grid technologies, we're really talking about one piece going down without taking the rest of the energy system down. So using our technologies to de-network and de-link as well as wall in um, is one uh, part of the solution that uh, we see a lot of promise in, but not as much activity yet as we would like to see. Thank you. Chris, how's the whole cybersecurity fallout affected India? Um, you know, um, we have to uh, look at uh, this um, differently. Innovation is always ahead of um, um, the loss of the c loss of the state and things like that. And um, <clears throat> today, the capability that technology provides uh, is, you know, far exceeded uh, our understanding of what should be and how should be managed and governed. This I believe that uh, laws will be created. Uh, uh, new um, equilibrium will be reached between the state, the business, the um, citizen, 
because of um, uh, the nature of technology. If you flip it the other way around, uh, the power in the hands of the individual is unprecedented. No time in the history of the world can you actually uh, tape something and upload onto the internet and millions and billions of people can download it and hear your voice, see what you want to say without any state being able to stop it actually. So, uh, you know, we have to look at it and say, okay, how can we look at it in a different manner? India has uh, similar challenges, actually. And, of course, we are not yet so connected. So we are not yet faced with the same problem. On the emerging market, quickly, um, you know, I realize now we have new competition uh, from uh, uh, Europe. But that's how it should be. You know, in the interconnected world, competition is good. Um, emerging markets are going to compete. Some of the fastest growth th growth markets are emerging markets. You know, India growing at uh, five six percent, China growing at seven eight percent, and and that's where the opportunities are. And and the better um, run, better managed uh, countries will attract uh, bet better and higher in investments. That's how it should be. Thank you, Marissa. That <coughs> issue that uh, has dominated news headlines of cybersecurity. How has that uh, played out for you? Uh, I think that in terms of security and privacy, the annual meeting represents a place where we can have a lot of discussion and debate. And we're really at the beginning of that debate uh, in terms of how governments should be addressing it, how corporations should be addressing it. Certainly at Yahoo, we have a very firm belief that users are in control of their data. There should be transparency, which we provide in terms of where their data is stored, how it is used. We issue a transparency report globally in terms of the requests we receive. Uh, and we've been somewhat constrained in terms of the NSA uh, in the United States and their requests and what we can be transparent about. We've made a call for uh, additional transparency there. Um, but for us, this is really a period uh, where we get to have the discussion, have the debate, and also for our company, uh, an opportunity to really invest uh, for our users' privacy, security, and ultimately their trust. And just on emerging market opportunities, I know, sorry to push you with your throat uh, in, in such tough shape. Do you s where do you see the opportunities lying in those emerging markets? You mentioned Africa just earlier. Uh, I think that there's uh, tremendous opportunities, uh, and we see them you know, all over the world. Um, and when I look at what we are achieving in terms of communicating and allowing people to communicate and connect uh, to each other in the Middle East, in Indonesia, we see unprecedented numbers of people coming online using mobile technology uh, and really getting the benefit of all of the different contexts and applications that are available to them. Thank you. Aliko Dankote, what's your... Uh, what's your view on those two issues of cybersecurity and the emerging market opportunities that face us? Well, I think <clears throat> there are quite a lot of uh, opportunities, but it's like what Marissa said that, uh, you know, obviously if uh, they have to respect people's uh, privacy, you know, uh, obviously if there's no privacy, then definitely the future of, uh, you know, uh, IT, uh, I mean, uh, ICT will be a little bit uh, doubtful. <clears throat> I personally believe that, uh, you know, uh, going back to looking at emerging markets, Africa, the opportunities are enormous. Uh, it's just that we have not actually, you know, even uh, started. Actually, you know, I was telling a friend of mine uh, when I came through, uh, you know, Geneva, and I was telling him that, you know, I am imagining that in the next, uh, you know, 10 years, you are not even going to have any immigration officer. Uh, at most of the airports in Europe. Maybe you just go and scan your passport and uh, walk through. I think that's what I'm looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of our co-chairs. We're out of time. They all have sessions to go to. You probably do too. Uh, thanks to all of you, and I wish everyone a very successful and interesting 44th annual meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.